Okay, running 111. Welcome to week one. Uh, this is my quick um, lesson and overview of the week video for week one. Uh, I'm here in front of Canyon Commons. I thought it would be fun to come over here to record my video today. Uh, just behind, or in, behind you, or in front of me, is the new um, student center, and so it might be. Um, gratifying, satisfying for you to just get a glimpse of that. So there you go. It's, it's going up quickly. Uh, and it'll be ready when you get back in the fall, um, according if everything goes according to plan, from what I understand. Okay, so let me just begin with a uh, week one overview. You can see below this, um, or in this week one um, unit, that I've listed uh, the seven steps um, or tasks to complete for the week. And this is what I'll do each week. I'll just list them out and you need to complete them sequentially. So before you watch this video, for instance, you're supposed to have already read the article, take this fish and look at it, and completed the reading response quiz for that article. All right, so um, that's an example of how that works. Um, so pause the video now and go back and complete those two steps if you haven't done so yet. Uh, and then after this video lesson, you should proceed with the re remaining steps. Um, I'll let, me, let me say one or two uh, comments about a few of those before we begin the lesson uh, that I will be spending most of this video on. Step four is do the observe and interpret assignment. So this is a, a, a writing prompt, a, um, a piece of homework where you're going to read a short text and respond to it, uh, making observations about what you see and uh, offering an interpretation about what it means. Uh, this is the main learning objective of the course, but I want to capture uh, from the from the beginning uh, how well you're doing that before you go through the curriculum uh, and the lessons of the course. So we can see uh, by the end of the course how different you uh, approach that type of activity, that kind of writing uh, that we're focusing on here. So this is a way of uh, seeing where you're at, uh, and it's and it's practice to to apply one or two of the keep elements that we're working on in this first unit. So the thing to know about that observe and interpret assignment is that I'm timing it. I'm giving you a 50 minute time limit to do it on Foxtail. So just be aware before you begin that um, assignment, which is actually a quiz function in Foxtail, that it's timed and once you open the quiz and, and, and hit start, you'll, you'll only have 50 minutes uh, to read. It's a very short, about a paragraph. And, uh, and then to respond with what you're seeing. It's not a formal piece of writing, just write what you're observing. Uh, you shouldn't um, uh, stress out about it, it's very uh, casual, uh, but it is timed, so make sure you're ready to go and sit at your desk uh, or at your laptop for 50 minutes, up to 50 minutes of uninterrupted writing time, reading and writing time. Okay, the other thing to note about um, the steps for week one is that your first um, your first reading journal entry is due at that's the last step of the week so you'll need to read the reading journal instructions which are linked in week one and then below the instruction page you'll see every week which what the text is that I'm asking you to to read and respond to in your journal so right below the instructions week one there's an article uh, by Christina Moon that I'm asking you to read in week one and respond to as your first reading journal um, okay, so uh, those are the those are that's an overview of what you're doing in week one. So let me say now a few um, comments about the article that you should now have read. Um, take this fish and look at it, and uh, and give you a couple thoughts about the course uh, as we begin here in the first week. What we're going to be focusing on, and what I want you to think about as you begin your first writing assignments this week. Uh, so, take this fish and look at it. You know, it's a very simple uh, kind of a, almost like a proverb or a, um, a moral story about um, what it's like for, to be a student, uh, or at least one specific way of looking at um, how learning happens. It's, it's a story in, in some ways about how learning works. Uh, and it focuses uh, very specifically on this idea of observing closely uh, uh, whatever your subject is, whether it's an animal or a specimen, or 
uh, it could be, as, as we'll see in this course, it could be a text, something that somebody wrote. Looking at it closely and through that process of looking, uh, l gaining a, a sense of what it means, forming one's own interpretation about it, and, uh, and seeing details as you continue to look and look more deeply that aren't at first noticeable, aren't on the surface, uh, and, and by that process becoming better at looking. Uh, so I, I do want to look at that article in, in some detail, uh, and, I, and you, you should have responded um, in the quick reading response quiz what some of the things you're seeing in that article are. Uh, but in a very broad sense, this is a kind of big picture article or an ur text for this course. What you're doing in this course, in a manner of speaking, is taking a fish, uh, but uh, instead of a fish, a, a piece of writing, and looking at it and seeing what it is telling us, uh, seeing what the author's purpose is, seeing what the details mean in the, in the piece of writing that uh, you're observing. Now, uh, let me take a step back and, and, and try to say why that's the focus and why I want to bring that idea of what reading and writing is to your attention here from the get-go. Um, what this is typically called in um, higher education and in education in general is uh, it's sometimes called close reading. And uh, when we talk about close reading, what we're talking about is very concentrated and undistracted attention on a, on a specific passage or a specific work. Uh, and, it, and it's the idea that you are sitting in front of a text and giving your own interpretation of it and not looking to external sources, not looking to other places to explain what the text means. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the process of forming your own interpretation based on the analysis tools that you have internal to yourself as a as an observant and an in intelligent reader. Okay, so if you think about it, like you can think about it like this: uh, it's just you in the text, or to to flip that around, all of the things that you would typically use to explain the text are held off uh, to the one side, or are held at bay, or not allowed. In, in the process, at least at the beginning, um, while you encounter the text for yourself, just on your own terms. So for instance, um, when, when people in college, in, in, in um, a variety of college courses, or in high school, or in the world, when they, when they encounter something, they often find it easier or more natural to find out what other people say the text means, what this piece of writing means. They look um, at Wikipedia, for instance, or, they, they, or on the internet, or ask, uh, or look at books to see what other people say this piece of writing means. Um, the other thing they can do is look at or rely on what the culture is telling them the text means. There's a, a sort of cultural acceptance about what something says. Maybe, for instance, at George Fox, there's a kind of cultural understanding of perhaps like what the Bible says or something like that. And that cultural understanding, that kind of um, very general wisdom about what a, something means can replace or stand in for, substitute for what that text actually says. That's different. Saying sort of like what generally Christians say the Bible means is different from you saying what you see um, the Bible meaning or what one passage of the Bible says that you are yourself forming an interpretation of, right? Um, we can also rely, instead of our own uh, our own observation, we can rely on um, the, the authorship or the history of the text uh, to stand in. So instead of saying what the Bible means, we might research the authorship history or the historical context of the Bible. When and where it was written, by whom person, why did they write this, uh, what was the historical situation or the cultural situation happening at the time? That's all very inf interesting information. But, in fact, it is different from what the text itself is saying, according to its own internal structure. Right? So, once again, you can know a lot about the historical circumstances of, just as an example, the Bible, and why it was written, but not, therefore, necessarily understand what the Bible says and what it means. 
right? And then finally, uh, and this one's a little less obvious, or I think it's a little more counterintuitive, we can often ask ourselves, we can often substitute for an interpretation what the, uh, what the text says to me, to me personally, to myself, in a very personal, private way. So for instance, if I say, well, to me, the Bible, and then I, and I give an interpretation that is very personal because of my own personal experience and background, and it's, and, and it's personal in a way that you can't um, connect to as, as, my, um, as somebody I'm talking to, then that, pri that meaning is too private to me to, to really be um, um, a good explanation of what the text means in itself. It's another way of substituting what the text means uh, with something that um, is not generally shared among readers. Okay, so that one's a little less obvious, um, and uh, I don't want you to worry too much about that one, but that's yet another way in which we can uh, avoid making our own interpretation of something. Um, well, to me it means this, a kind of an opinion-based thing, rather than showing what it says, and actually being able to say, here's where it says this and how it says it. Okay, so what I've just listed off are a, are a number of ways that in the real world people actually go around most of the time not really encountering texts directly, not forming their own interpretations directly uh, about what something is saying, about what they're reading, and letting other voices, uh, cultural voices, specific expert voices, uh, internet voices, or our own private voices, telling us what something means instead of looking at it itself. Okay? So that's a um, that's the, the, the translation or the... the, the the um, the reason why I give you this reading, take a fish and look at it to start the course, because what I'm what I'm asking you to do is take a a, a fish and look at it. I don't want you to look up what fishes are uh, on the internet. I don't want you to ask me what fishes are. I want you to look at the fish and make your own interpretations. Okay, so that's uh, the first point I want to make. Um, now, how do you do that? Let's just talk about a couple tools, a couple practices that readers can use to form their interpretations. Um, first of all, I want to uh, evoke uh, an idea by Beth S. Neiman, who writes about um, uh, forming interpretations of texts. And she uses the metaphor of antenna uh, on the top of your head, like you're an insect. And she says a reader should pretend that uh, he or she is an insect or a bug that has these antenna on top of her head. And these antenna look, they're very sensitive as, as insect antennae uh, are. And they look for patterns or clues in the text. They, they are, they're looking for things that might uh, suggest um, something unusual or something that seems important, uh, but it's not clear what that is exactly. Um, Perhaps uh, there's a light bulb at the end of the antenna, and they light up, um, and they flash when they see something that looks out of place or interesting or unusual. So um, imagining antenna on the top of your head is, is one way of, of thinking about it. Anything that draws attention to itself uh, might be important and might be worth um, observing and noticing and thinking about what that uh, means. Um, so when you see something, when you observe something, when your antennae flash, uh, what is it you have to wonder that uh, is going on there? What is, here's a question you can ask. Why did the author put that there? Why did the author use that construction or emphasize that point? Um, and then, after you've thought about that, you can ask, how does the point fit into the whole work or into the whole passage that I'm looking at? Uh, what's the what's the author's purpose? All right, th those are the two main questions you can ask. Why did the author put this here? The thing I'm noticing, and what does it mean when I think about the whole thing? All right. Um, another way of asking uh, these questions, or another way of phrasing this tool, is to just say you're looking for words or phrases or sentences that stand out to you. Uh, what words stand out? Uh, which words have strong or interesting connotations. Uh, what effect does the word choice have on you as a reader? Does it seem like there's 
a second meaning to something when you look at uh, the words that are standing out to you. Uh, and then we can even ask things like, what's the tone of this word? What is the attitude being uh, suggested by this word? Um, maybe you know something about metaphors and similes and symbols, and you can um, form an observation about what might be going on on that level uh, in what you're noticing. But I don't even necessarily want to get into the, those kinds of complexities yet. We'll look at those things a little bit later. I just want you to notice words and observe what the connotations and tone of words are, uh, what the meaning of those words uh, are, and why you think, or what you think that those words are emphasizing. Okay, let me give you an example. I'm just going to use one example from the reading, This take this fish and look at it. Uh, and, and, and just show you what I'm talking about. So for instance, I'm looking at the eighth paragraph of the article, uh, number eight on page 271. And let me just read uh, that first sentence of that paragraph, and then I'll, I'll make my observation, my antennae will, uh, will flash, and I'll tell you what's going on in my head as I observe. All right? And this is very much like what you should do in most of the writing assignments in this course. Just notice things and talk about what, describe what you're noticing. So here's an example of me describing what I notice. So that the eighth paragraph starts this way. In 10 minutes, I had seen all that could be seen in that fish and started to search. I started in search of the professor who had, however, left the museum. And when I returned after lingering over some of the odd animals stored in the upper apartment, my specimen was dry all over. Okay, just in that sentence, I underlined 10 minutes, all right, because having read to the end, I know that there's something important going on in this article about, uh, about Scudder, the, the speaker, uh, who's a persona of Scudder. Um, there's something important about time and patience, and I noticed that now that I looked at that sentence again, I noticed that at first, the very early stages of looking at the fish, he gets impatient after 10 minutes, and it's a very short amount of time uh, to look at the fish, but actually to look at a fish for 10 minutes is actually probably very long and boring at the very beginning of this process of learning how to notice uh, what, what, uh, looking at this fish. All right, so the 10 minutes stood out to me. Um, I look at the end of that paragraph. Let me read a couple of the last sentences of that paragraph. This little excitement over... Nothing was to be done but to return to a steadfast gaze at my mute companion. Half an hour passed, an hour, another hour. The fish began to look loathsome. I turned it over and around, looked it in the face, ghastly, from behind, beneath, above, sideways, at three-quarters view, just as ghastly. I was in despair. At an early hour, I concluded that lunch was necessary, so with infinite relief... The fish was carefully replaced in the jar, and for an hour, I was free. Okay, words I noticed that stood out to me was ghastly. All right, He's looking at the fish, and he says twice, it looks ghastly to him. Um, and then when he can't handle this anymore, he goes to lunch early, and he says, for an hour, I was free. So that word free also stands out to me. He's really feeling trapped or 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 uh, somehow um, constrained or imprisoned by this assignment and so to leave it uh, to put it on pause and walk away is a feeling of freedom it's relief to him right so I'm just saying back what I'm just I'm describing what I've just read and the things that I noticed are the the tone and the and the emphasis seems to be on how quickly he got bored only 10 minutes and how afraid or how um, uncomfortable he is. He has to look at this thing and he says it's ghastly. And he, when he lets go to lunch, he feels free. So these words tell me that at this moment in the story, he's feeling bored, quickly bored by the fish in his assignment. He's feeling very almost uncomfortable, almost afraid at what he's looking at. It's, it's ghastly. That's kind of like there's fear in that word and there's kind of a, a disgust in that word. Um, so that's not something he wants to be doing, and he's avoiding it even. He goes to lunch early, right? So here's me as a reader just saying back what I'm noticing in the text. 
So that's the first step. I'm just noticing words, what they seem to be suggesting and emphasizing, what their connotations are, what their tone is. And then I'm forming some observations about those things. Now, if I went to the second step, which was how does that fit into the work as a whole? Well, if I step back and I think about what is Scudder saying in this whole story, he's saying that this is a really important lesson that he learns, that Professor Aziz tells him to, shows him what it really means to be a naturalist, to be a scientist, to look at a fish, to look at any animal really intently. And so why would he, or what does it mean that at, at the beginning stages of that lesson, uh, this student is feeling very uncomfortable, bored, and even afraid, right? So if I was interpreting, I might t try to make some speculations about what that might mean, what that kind of suggests about the learning process, about the noticing process or the, the looking process. What is Scudder saying about what it's like to look at something and what it means to become good at looking at something? Something about initial boredom and fear have to fit into that picture seems to be what he's trying to tell us about that process. So if I was interpreting this story in light of that observation, I'd have to try to connect that in some way. Okay, so that's my very quick example of what it would be like to, to notice things and to inform interpretations about them. And that's what you're going to do in the next step for this first unit. You're going to do the observe and interpret uh, activity that's timed. Uh, and then you're going to uh, read another uh, portion of this lesson uh, that I'm just going to write out or um, put into text form called Summary and Paraphrase. Uh, and then you're going to do the reading journal. And that's all I'm asking you to do this week. Um, so uh, you're just beginning with uh, that very simple first step of looking and observing. Uh, and then when we come back next week, we'll, um, we'll take that to the next level of what it means to look at text in different ways, uh, and, I'll, and I'll introduce that next week. So uh, good luck with your first week, uh, your first uh, activities. Uh, email me questions you might have, and, uh, and enjoy looking.